Well, good evening, everyone. Good morning if you're watching this during regular class time, uh, but it's evening when I'm recording this. Uh, you don't need to know what's going on here. So today's lecture, we are going to focus on problem solving using our equations for accelerated motion. We started this last time when we um, did this problem where a rock was being dropped off of a tall cliff. So um, if you want to go back and review our work through this problem, it's still up here, up here on the slide. Um, you can do that. Remember, there are the three equations that we're going to use to solve for uh, to to solve the problems dealing with accelerated motion. Those three equations are uh, quickly, just as a a recap, we have v final equals v initial plus acceleration times time where the V stands for velocity. We have our final position equals our initial position plus the initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared. And then we have um, our final velocity squared equals our initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the change in position. When we have Free fall, uh, the three problems we're going to work uh, today all involve free fall. In free fall, we have the same equations. All that we have uh, to change the equations is that we know that the acceleration is minus g, that is to say minus 9.8 meters per second squared. That assumes that positive y is in the upward direction. That's not necessarily always going to be the case. It's typically what we choose. It's what's most familiar in terms of our everyday experience, that up is positive, down is negative, the floor is zero, etc. cetera. Um, therefore, all we need to do is replace that into our equation. As an example, the middle equation becomes x final. Excuse me, if we're in the y direction, we can change x final with y final. We can talk about y positions. Um, or we could declare the x direction to be up and down. That's fine, too. But typically, we'll save that for y. y initial plus vy initial times t plus 1 half times minus 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. So the three problems we're going to use, uh, we're going to solve today, all use the acceleration of free fall. Uh, they're all situations where something is in free fall. When we did the rock problem last time, here it is, we had a rock that was dropped off of the side of a tall cliff. The cliff was 100 meters uh, above the ground. So we chose our initial y uh, position, excuse me, to be 100. The ground we set to be zero, that would be the final y location, position. And since we were dropping it from rest, that's what told us that our initial y velocity was zero. Let's solve a different problem with a slightly um, similar situation where we have the same cliff. We're throwing it from the same height, but we're going to throw downward with a velocity of four meters per second. So instead of dropping the ball, let's get a prop here. Uh, let me find a, a prop. Boom, magic. It's appeared before our very eyes. So instead of dropping the, the ball, or the rock off the cliff, we're going to throw it down, right? The difference is, instead of letting go, we are going to throw it downward with an initial velocity that is non-zero. So I'll go to the next page to actually solve the problem, but the big, um, whoops, I'm in the wrong screen. <laughs> I do that all the time, get used to it. Let me go over here. Uh, we have a downward velocity that is four meters per second. Now, if the velocity is downward, there we go, we're back started. Um, we need to be sure that we include information about that downward. So under the same assumption, I just got a warning that uh, something was wrong, so hopefully we're okay. All I've written is the word same assumption. Under the same assumption, I had a little bit of a freezing. Hopefully the video still turns out okay. Um, that up 
is the positive y direction. If that's our assumption with a downward velocity, v initial is going to be minus four meters per second. The minus sign tells us it's pointing down. Now we can use the same formulas to answer the question of how long does it take for the rock to hit the ground. So if we go to a new slide, there we go. We have, let's draw a quick little diagram of what our situation is. Here's our cliff. Here is the floor or the, the ground below the cliff. Here's our rock and it has a downward initial velocity of minus four meters per second. It's going to go faster and faster and faster so that right before it hits the ground, it has some final velocity. We're not asked for the final velocity. We're just gonna focus on time. The first uh, few problems we're gonna solve for the time. So if we look at our expression that has positions and initial velocities in time, we can use this expression again, y final is y initial plus vi in the y direction t. Right now it's not so important to have y subscripts on vi y. I'm doing that, you'll see for next week, we'll see why I'm gonna like specifying whether we're talking in the y direction or not. Here we're just in one dimension, so our equations just have to match for that dimension. Um, so a little bit of over notating, hopefully you can forgive me and see why I'm doing that next week. Times the acceleration times t squared. Okay, there's our formula. If we make that little list that we've been talking about, we have y initial, y final, v initial, acceleration, v final. And the acceleration and time. So we know our initial position is 100 meters. Our final position is the ground, that's zero meters. Our initial velocity was a downward, so negative four meters per second. Um, our acceleration is a downward 9.8 meters per second. Notice how both of the things that are pointing down are negative. And time is the thing that we're looking for in this particular scenario. So that's what leads us to this equation. That's sort of the discussion we had last time. Nothing has changed except this value for velocity. We have a new downward velocity. So we can solve for t. We have that the... Um, y final is zero, y initial is 100. We have minus four times t. I'm dropping the units. I'm just gonna look at the numbers. And then I have plus one half times 9.8 times t squared. I'm gonna erase this arrow to make sure that it's not in our way. Excuse me, I made a mistake. Minus 9.8, negative 9.8. So simplifying this gets us zero is 100. Just cleaning it up a little bit, minus 4t, minus 4.9t squared. Now, if you look back at what we did in the previous problem, we had this expression here, which only had a t squared in it. So I could just solve this algebraically by doing the same thing to both sides, subtracting 100 from both sides, dividing by negative 4.9, and so forth. Here I've got a t and a t squared. So I do need to use the quadratic formula to solve for t. I'll remind you that um, if zero is equal to a t squared or a x squared, let's look use just general x's and things like that. A x squared plus b, this is how you probably learned it in middle school, um, then x is equal to the um, opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. If you've got a quadratic solver on your calculator programmed in, that's fine. You can take the easy way out. You can also um, commit the quadratic formula to memory and amaze your friends and maybe win at bar trivia later on in your life. Who knows? So we're going to apply the quadratic formula to this relationship, I'm gonna make a new page. Oops, I've been under my picture a little bit. Uh, did I, oh, we're good. I just won't well, right there, we'll make a new page. So we had zero is, let's see if I can make a little note to myself. There we go, I won't go farther than that. 
we had 0 equals 100 minus 4t minus 4.9t squared. So t is going to equal opposite of 100 that I saw for that. Here we go. I want to make sure I have my work. Yep, opposite of 4. So opposite of negative 4, so that's positive 4, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. Now, since I'm dividing by a negative, and in this case, I know that I'm only going to have the positive time be a real uh, meaningful result. I'm going to choose the negative on the top side, so I'm forcing the numerator to be negative to divide by a negative denominator to get a real time. Um, if I had the plus side, there's the chance that I would have a negative time, and I need a positive time, so I need a negative over a negative to give me a positive time. I think I may have misspoken just a moment ago. Hopefully, the last phrase I said was right. I need a positive time. I'm forced to have a negative denominator, so I need to be sure I have a negative numerator so that I have negative over negative is positive there. I think I got it all right. Um, solving this out, we get 4.13 seconds. This time is less than our time when we just dropped it. That was 4.52 seconds. So throwing it down speeds its descent to the ground. That makes some reasonable sense. Now, what's going to happen if we throw the ball up at the same speed? So we did the problem where we threw it down at 4 meters per second. Let's look at what happens when we throw the ball up. Oops, I don't want this one. I want to add a slide here. So let's ask ourselves the question, uh, what is the time that the ball takes to fall? if thrown up at an initial velocity is positive 4 meters per second. So now we're going to, instead of throwing the ball down, we're going to throw it up and let it fall back down. So we toss it up, and then it comes back down. It's going to first go up, then come back down. We'll see in more detail later um, that we don't need to break this into several parts. We are going to talk about motion on the way up to the zenith or the apex of its flight. But I want to show us, starting now, that all we need to do is use the equations that we were given and put the right starting information in. The beauty of the equations is I only need to know the in initial conditions most often in order to get a result about what's going to happen later. Here's what I mean by that. Same equation y final equals y initial plus vi times t plus one half a t squared. If we make our little chart, we know I have v initial is positive four meters per second. v final acceleration is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. I know my y initial is 100 meters as it was before. I know my y final is zero, and I'm looking for my time, right? So there's that little chart that we've been doing. So all that's changed is I have a positive v initial, same acceleration, same y initial, same y final, looking for time. So obviously I'm going to use the same relationship. For the different set of inputs, though, we have a different outcome. So when we put in, okay, y final is zero meters, y initial is 100 meters, plus a positive 4 meters per second times time, plus 1 half times negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. Whoops, I have another quadratic, so I'm just going to solve another quadratic. t is equal to opposite of b, negative 4, plus or minus the square root. Uh, opposite of b plus or minus the square root is b squared, so I've got 4 squared again, minus 4 times a, that'll simplify to negative 4.9, times c, that's 100, divided by 2a, so that's going to be 2 times negative 4.9, and 
And again, you calculate out a little bit. We'll save that calculation for um, you to do if you're curious, but we just evaluate the quadratic formula. The positive time is, again, the one that makes sense. You'll only get one positive answer. And we get 4 point. Does that say 9, 4? I'm going to pause so I can't read my little scribble. I'm going to recalculate it. Just give me a second. Okay, we get 4.94 as our time, which again should make some sense. When we drop it and we get a certain time, if we throw it down from the same height, it takes a little less time to hit the ground, and now we're throwing it up, so it's got to go up and then come back down. It should take some more time. So the same equation with different initial conditions allows us to answer different questions. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other assumptions we can make um, depending on the motion that we're talking about. So here's a problem that deals with spud web. NC State basketball great spud web. So here we have a problem with spud web um, jumping up. We're told some data about the height of his vertical leap off the ground. This 110 centimeters, if we were to mark up the picture here, right, the 110, let's get it a little bit easier to see, oh, come on now, right, the 110 centimeters would be this distance here, 1.1 meters is how far off the ground he can leap under some assumptions, right, one of the assumptions that, that we will use, um, in this problem, I suppose the assumption is really that this picture is at its maximum height. It's not an assumption, it's a truth that when we throw something up in the air, the initial velocity, let's talk about a general case here. If I have an object that, as time goes by, starts out with some velocity here, and then we're going to have some different times, okay? This is instant one. We'll draw instant two here, instant three, and so forth. Instant four, and maybe instant five. I don't know if I'll need all five, right? So these are different times. Time one, time two, time three, time four, time five. Maybe they're all a second or a half second apart. If we are in free fall, that means that our acceleration is minus g. Now the acceleration is the change in velocity. So here's v1 that takes us over here. That velocity has gotten smaller. There's v2 that takes us over here. Maybe at v3 the velocity is zero, but then we have that same acceleration acting on us. So here's v4 and then here's v5, right? So as time goes by each instant, the velocity changes. The change in the velocity is the acceleration. The acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So our velocity is pointing up. If the change is negative, that's going to decrease that velocity arrow that I've drawn in the picture. That happens again. That change decreases the velocity from 2 to 3, but it decreases it such that it gets to 0. But then from 3 to 4, it decreases it. But since it started at 0, that just makes it more negative, And it starts going down. So as we toss an object up, we notice it kind of freezes there at the top, there at the top, there, right there at the top. It has an upward velocity. It pauses. And then it starts back down. It's hard to see with such a small toss. Take an object and throw it up straight not as far as you can go, but all the way up to almost hitting the ceiling in the room that you're in. Or go outside and throw an object up as far as you can into the air. It has an upward velocity. It's slowing down on its way up. That's what the acceleration of gravity is doing. It's slowing it until it stops, but then it's still accelerating. And that acceleration is down, which is why it starts to fall back down again. Therefore, at the top of its trajectory we say that the velocity is zero at the top, or the not the top, the top. The next word I want to write is max height. That's where the n came from. At the top, or the max height, 
v in the y direction is zero. We are momentarily at rest. Acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared. We know we have an acceleration because it's still going to fall down the next instant. It doesn't freeze there at the top. So its velocity at that moment is changing from a tiny upward velocity to a tiny downward velocity, which means its average velocity is zero. It's at rest at the top. So if ever we have a question that involves the maximum height of some launched projectile, here in this case, the launched projectile is Mr. Webb. He's at a maximum height of 110 centimeters, right? So that's our max height off the ground. We know that at that moment, his velocity is zero. He's temporarily at rest. So if his maximum height is where that picture was, we can use that along with a known final velocity to calculate the speed that he would leave the ground. That's telling us VI is what we want. In the previous problem, we were given VI. Here, we've got to make some assumptions about this moment in space-time to work backwards to determine what the initial conditions were. Let's think about the equations we could use to calculate such a thing. So let's look at our equations. We've got, we'll go down in order. VI is equal to V, sorry, VF is equal to VI plus the acceleration times time. Before we judge these equations, let's make our little list. VI is what we want. VF, we're saying zero because we're at the maximum height. Uh, we know the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. That's under the assumption that up is positive. So if we look at our y's, uh, we have y initial. We start on the ground is 0. y final is our 1.1 meters. And we don't know time. So we'll have to think about time. Now in this first equation, we're looking for vi. But we also don't know t, so this does not make a very good candidate for finding something useful. Now, our second equation, y final equals y initial plus vi times t plus one-half a t squared. Well, same problem here, right? We don't know vi, so it's nice that that's in the formula, but we also don't know t. So not the best case here. Now, notice with these two equations, we have two equations, two unknowns. But we've already done the substituting for two equations, two unknowns. That's what made the last equation. So we can use what would be the result of two equations, two unknowns, and substituting one unknown value in for the other. To get the last equation, v final squared, v initial squared, plus 2 times the acceleration times, in this case, delta y, not delta x, y final minus y initial. So if we put in our values, we know that we are at rest at the very apex of our jump. So we have 0 squared is 0. That's going to equal vi squared plus 2 times minus 9.8 meters per second squared times delta y, which is our y final minus 0. So I'll just write 1.1 meters. Solving this allows us to solve for vi, to calculate vi. And I get that VI for Mr. Webb is 4.64 meters per second. So that is the speed that he had to jump off the ground with in order to get that high. Notice in this problem, we needed to do some thinking about what our initial condition was. Our initial condition, if we were to draw a sketch, Whoops, that's not a very good basketball floor. Everyone would roll to the middle. Let's draw straight. Uh, a little better, right? Our initial condition is Mr. Webb just ready to make his leap into the air. Or rather, just when his feet leave the floor. So he is just leaving the floor, which means that his height of his feet are zero. They're on the ground. 
but he's got an upward velocity V initial that's going to start carrying him up into the air. Our, that's our initial picture. Our final picture has him up in the air. Probably ready to dunk a basketball. Uh, there he is. And he is now 1.1 meters off, right? Y final. He's 1.1 meters off the ground, but he, whoops, BF. His final velocity is zero. He's at the apex of his jump, the very top of his trajectory, where he's momentarily at rest. So while we are solving for VI, we did have to assume that that VI took place at YI equals zero. So there are some assumptions we have to fold into these problems in terms of values we have to assume that we know. It is a, um, a quantity that we have to add in if we are dealing with the top of the jump, specifically the location. We knew the position of the top of the jump at that moment. We also know how fast they're going. Uh, zero, because that's the moment where we turn around from an upward velocity to a downward velocity. The last problem I want to work um, is this problem here. I'll give you a second to read it. We have a volcano shooting little blobs of lava up into the air and coming back down. And I want to make uh, an important point here with this problem. Yep. So in this problem, we're dealt with the total time, or we're, we're given the total time, rather, that this little ball of lava takes to go all the way up and all the way back down. We want to know the initial speed that allowed it to go through that time. Something I see all the time, and I think it has to do with the way that these ideas were introduced in earlier physics classes. Um, I am operating under the assumption that if you've seen it before, this is why you're, you're doing this. The need, the perceived need to break this motion into parts. How long did it take to go up to the top? How long did it take to fall back down? At the top, we know the final velocity is zero. So that's true. We just used that in the previous problem. But that's because we were asked a question and we were given data about the location of the top of the jump. Here, we're not told how high the lava goes. And I want to show that with the formulas that we have, we can account for the entire motion over the entire time interval, 4.75 seconds. So here's what we would do for that. We can use the formula y final equals y initial plus v initial times t plus 1 half a t squared. Furthermore, we know that the time that we have here uh, is for the entire trajectory where it rises and falls back to the ground. So that tells us that the y initial and the y final are the same, right? We have at time t initial, the ball going up from the ground, and then it goes up and goes back down, and at time 4.75 seconds later, it's now hitting the ground and coming back down. So that means that our y final and our y initial are both zero, right? We don't have to worry about how high it is. We were never asked that. So if I want to solve for vi, I can use the following relationship. I'll drop the units just to save some space. Now notice that I did leave the acceleration negative. That's going to tell me that if VI is positive, it's going up in the air. So it's matching the coordinate system that we've been using so far in this lecture. Um, whoops, sorry. I wrote T squared. I mean to write 4.75 squared. So did I make it just above my picture? I did. Okay, I just squeezed it in there. So this is a pretty straightforward solution for VI. I'm going to have a negative result here until I move it over to the other side to solve for it, and that gives me a positive VI. So doing just the tiniest little bit of algebra, you get that VI is 24.2 meters per second. 
again, we may have seen problems like this, and we'll see it again in Chapter 3, where the solution approach we were shown relies on always breaking it down and finding the time to the top, and then the time that it falls, and working this problem twice. There's no need to do that as long as we're comfortable with up being positive, down being negative, and determining what the positions, initial and final, are. We can do it all in one equation. There's no need to break it into pieces. Let me ask one more follow-up question, um, and this will be the little assignment that we make for the in-class assignment. I'm going to think of this same lava piece with the same initial velocity. So for a molten lava blob, um, all right, so here's the question that I'm going to make a quick little assignment for you to answer on Blackboard. The lava blob is shot upwards at a initial velocity of 24.2 meters per second. I want to know um, at what times, I'm going to do this to be suggestive, ooh la la, at what times, hmm? is the lava blob, right? Isn't that what they're calling it? Lava bombs. Oh, lava bomb. What time is the lava bomb? Let me correct my terminology. I said lava blob. Let me erase this and write lava bomb. This little chunk. Oh, lava. Lava bomb, lava bomb. I should pause the video to do this. This is all just dead time. That's okay. We're still going to end early. For today, at what time is the lava bomb 12 meters off the ground? So assume, just like we did in the last problem, that the lava bomb leaves the ground. And I want to know at what time, maybe, if there's more than one, there are more than one, is it 12 meters off the ground? Think carefully about what equation you're going to use to solve this. We are told the initial velocity, the lava bomb is in free fall, so we know the acceleration. I know the initial position, zero. I know the final position, 12. Calculate the time that it takes to get 12 off the ground, and make sure, like in this problem, if you have two different times, you can rationalize why there are two different times. We'll start class on Monday talking about these two times. I want you to calculate both. And the That's great. Okay. I'm going to review the video to see how much of that worked out. In case it did freeze, I'm going to restate it. Um, the blackboard will set up will be set up for two answers. There are two times at which the lava bomb is 12 meters off the ground. So for both of those, we'll start class on Monday talking about what those two times mean. Um, if this is redundant, that just means that it didn't really freeze, but it just looked like it froze on my, on my side. Excellent work, everyone. Happy Friday. Good weekend. I'll see you in class virtually on Monday for our last week. So far as I've heard, our last week of virtual classes. Excellent work. Keep it up. Let me know when you have questions.